Your Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our final plenary session at This Wish, a final chance for us to bring together our conversations over the last two days. It's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce our final keynote speaker. She is a woman who has served in the highest public office in her own country. She's a global leader and influencer because of her other roles and because of the stance that she has taken on issues of central importance to human life and human experience. After her time as president of Ireland, she was the first woman to take that role. She became the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. She's also served as a UN envoy on climate change and for the Great Lakes region. And she now chairs the Elders, the group of former statesmen and women and leaders brought together by Nelson Mandela. Today, she is going to be focusing on climate change in her remarks to us, something that is probably still seen largely as an environmental challenge, but of course one that threatens human health and indeed our very existence. Please welcome Mary Robinson. Good afternoon, Your Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be back here in Doha at this impressive summit. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk about two topics that are close to my heart and deeply interlinked, climate change and planetary health. Both issues constitute existential threats if they're not addressed rigorously and urgently. But equally, they open up the possibility of new opportunities for future growth and prosperity if a systematic and inclusive policy approach is developed by states, by business, and by ordinary citizens. It might sound ironic to say this at the beginning of a keynote speech and towards the end of a conference of speakers, but I firmly believe that the time for talking is over. We need to act now and fast. As I'm sure you all know, last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report on the consequence of global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius and above. This report makes it abundantly clear that we have less than 12 years to take the necessary steps, the radical action to cut emissions by 45% by 2030. And also reduce the consumption and subsidizing of fossil fuels and invest in sustainable, renewable energy to avert a rise in global temperatures above 1.5 degrees that would have catastrophic consequences for global health. As my friend and fellow elder Gru Brundtland said, the IPCC report isn't a wake-up call, it's a ticking time bomb. The World Health Organization already predicts that between 2030 and 2050, climate change will cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. The direct costs to health from climate change, excluding costs in health-determining sectors such as agriculture and water and sanitation, is estimated to be between two to four billion dollars per year by 2030. Climate change threatens to reverse the gains made through the Millennium Development Goals, and it threatens to undermine any efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, health-related or otherwise. The IPCC has also said it expects climate change to lead to increases in ill health in many regions, particularly those furthest away from the Health Sustainable Development Goal, Goal 4. Examples include great, greater likelihood of injury, disease, and death due to more intense heat waves and fires, increased likelihood of undernutrition resulting from diminished food production in poor regions, risks from the lost work capacity and reduced labor productivity in vulnerable populations, and increased risks from food and waterborne diseases. What the latest report by the IPCC makes crystal clear is that the threats posed by a rise in temperatures above 1.5 degrees apply to every country, every country in the world, regardless of income level, and demand a concerted, joined-up global approach. 
For example, I don't need to remind anyone here in Qatar about the health risks of extreme heat. But had I been giving this lecture a year ago in northern Sweden, at the, this point, of the, the audience would probably have smiled and said, that's all very well, but it's not really a problem for us. If I were giving it here today, there today, though, I can assure you they would be nodding in sober agreement. The past summer, we saw the most unbelievable spectacle of wildfires in Sweden's Arctic Circle, as well as in many other parts of Europe. These heat waves represent what we call the new normal. They are more, there are more extremes, they last longer, and reach further because of climate change. And they're not just isolated incidents. The long-term trend shows more and more people are being exposed to heat waves as the Earth's climate changes. And a number of you mentioned to me the flooding that took place recently here in Qatar, which also is unusual for this country. In 2016, over 150 million people were exposed to life-threatening heat wave conditions. And the threat is particularly acute for the young, the elderly, the disabled, and the poor. Meeting this challenge will require the political will to commit substantial financial investment to climate-resilient health infrastructure. It means embedding climate change mitigation, reaction, and adaptation into long-term health planning, and ensuring environmental and economic policies are centered around health needs. Hospitals and other health institutions need to consider this in practical, tangible terms. How do their buildings and operations contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? Are their consumption models efficient and sustainable? How do they dispose of medical waste? And do they have a holistic approach that includes the needs of the wider community? On a policy level, for the past three years, the elders have been championing universal health coverage across the globe as the best way to meet both the health SDG and promote accessible, affordable health care to all. We're convinced that providing universal health coverage is one of the most important drivers of development and a crucial means of tackling the health impacts of climate change. And there's a crucial linkage between ending fossil fuel subsidies, improving health outcomes, and building political consensus behind climate resilient policies. Subsidies to fossil fuel industries are clearly unacceptable and unsustainable. And the elders have written on several occasions to the leaders of the G20 and the G7 to hold them to their word and demand a comprehensive abolition of these measures. But consumer subsidies, for example, on fuel products, are popular with the general population, particularly in developing countries. And leaders face a considerable political challenge when seeking to reduce or end them. However, countries such as Iran and Indonesia have shown that it is possible to reduce these subsidies when some of the saved public resources are channeled directly to increasing spending on healthcare. People see that this is actually helping them in healthcare, and it makes it easier to remove the subsidies. The public sees an immediate benefit as well as the long-term advantages of a healthier environment, and the leader should then employ a broader mandate to pursue sustainable environmental, social, and health policies. But our responses cannot be driven solely by political expediency or enlightened self-interest. I believe it's essential that we look at both climate change and healthcare through the prism of human rights, to which every person on earth is entitled. In this hall, I see many talented medical professionals representing world-class hospitals and research institutes with an almost unparalleled capacity for technological innovation. Yet given this abundance of global resources, how can it possibly be acceptable that hundreds of millions of our global citizens still cannot access or afford the health care that they need for themselves and their families, including in some of the richest countries on the planet, notably the United States. Innovation in technology, surgical techniques, and health systems has brought huge benefits to healthcare in recent decades and transformed our understanding of how the human body and mind works. But innovation alone won't achieve the systemic changes needed to extend these benefits to the most vulnerable and marginalized people in our societies whose health needs are, of course, greatest.
Ultimately, this comes down to a question of political will and priorities. As with climate change, leaders need to realize that it's in their own interests and those of their countries to have a healthy population and a society with institutions and infrastructure that is sufficiently resilient in the face of climate change. In both cases, the state remains the indispensable actor and must therefore bear the chief responsibility for funding healthcare and climate policies. These responsibilities cannot be abdicated or outsourced to the private sector. You only have to look at the United States to see the damaging consequences of a market-driven health system where the profit motive trumps patients' healthcare needs and where vested interests from private hospitals to the pharmaceutical industry spend billions of dollars to thwart even modest efforts to extend public insurance and healthcare provision. Equally, although it's commendable that many businesses, including in the energy sector, are now acknowledging the realities of climate change and the need to take action, corporate social responsibility can only ever be um, a, a complement to rigorous state regulation underpinned by internationally agreed commitments. In our globalized world, this can only be done by multi multilateral cooperation. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the Sustainable Development Goals are two landmark multilateral achievements that serve as a rebuke to the cynics, or so-called real politic advocates, who argue that nations will never be, uh, act out of altruism. Both the Paris Agreement and the SDGs are a declaration of solidarity, not only with today's global citizens, but future generations. You recall the repetition of no one left behind, and even prioritize the furthest behind first. The notion that the globalized nature of our economic and political order can in some way be halted or reversed is frankly illiterate. Leaders who pursue a unilateral path who disdain cooperation and who renege on previously agreed agreements need to go back to their history books. I've in fact just come from Paris, where President Macron organized a major peace forum, as you know, to mark the centenary of the end of the First World War. The historical anniversary is a stark reminder of the catastrophe, catastrophe that can ensue when multilateral cooperation breaks down and leaders believe their interests can be best served by bellicose actions. The war in Europe devastated a whole generation. It literally poisoned the land. Some of the soil where the trenches lay is still contaminated by degraded munitions and poison gas. Moreover, the devastating impact of the conflict on public health and medical institutions and infrastructure meant that when an epidemic of Spanish influenza broke out in the winter of 1918, just as the guns were falling silent, it spread like wildfire and ended up killing as many people as the war itself. So all of us here, doctors, health experts, politicians and former politicians, have a responsibility to put pressure on leaders to take climate and health seriously, to see them as human rights issues that are inextricably intertwined and to make these leaders understand that if they don't act in concert with each other, they are damning us all to failure, if not an annihilation. We're at an existential moment. There is a threat to the future of our children and grandchildren. As some of you will know, for many years, I've advocated the need for a climate justice approach to tackling the challenges of global warming. Climate justice is a transformational concept compelling a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement with the people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart. Climate justice links human rights and development to achieve a human-centered approach, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable people and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and its impacts equitably and fairly. Think of the billion people who never switched the switch for electricity if they could get renewable energy off grid, and we know the gadgets exist, but they're not getting to these people quickly enough. The 2.7 billion who still cook on open fires and ingest smoke, and yet we have clean cook stoves and could do more to get them out. That's the benefit. I believe we also need to think about health justice to ensure that ordinary people are always at the heart of health policy, 
and that their needs are paramount above the profit motives of industry or the short-term calculations of politicians. It's clearly a grave health injustice when poor women and their newborn babies are detained in hospitals because their families simply can't afford their medical fees. But this is the reality of thousands of people in health systems dominated by private financing and weak governance. Both climate and health policies need to understand the specific needs of vulnerable and marginalized groups who have been too often overlooked, including women, girls, adolescents, people with mental health issues, indigenous peoples, sexual minorities, and nomadic communities. They also need to understand the intersectionality of these diverse groups and needs. Injustice cannot be overcome if each issue is treated as its own individual silo or without appreciating the complex interconnections between the different drivers of ill health, poverty, prejudice, and discrimination. I've endeavored to spend my life in the service of those marginalized or made vulnerable by discrimination because of gender, race, or poverty. I take as my guide Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We're going to mark the 70th anniversary on the 10th of December next month. And the, it begins that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. It's important to note, however, that this declaration signed in 1948 and the two international human rights covenants adopted in 1966 don't include any specific reference to a right to a healthy environment. More and more countries are acknowledging this as a right, but it's still not fully there at the global level. When I had the honor to serve as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002, climate change wasn't on the radar of, the, of human rights institutions. It was through my later work on human rights in Africa that I came to understand that any advances in development were threatened by the impacts of climate change. Last year, together with my fellow elder and dear sister, Grasa Michelle, I visited Tanzania to encourage that country's progress towards universal health coverage. We met rural women who still only had scant access to medical services and products, despite the dedicated efforts of local doctors. If real and enduring progress is to be made towards universal health coverage in Tanzania, the needs of these people need to be at the top of the agenda for every officer in the Ministry of Health and indeed the Ministry of Finance and the Prime Minister's office. Governments and companies need legitimacy and trust to be able to operate effectively in society. This applies to the Middle East as much as to rural um, Africa and indeed to the whole world. If these actors don't prioritize action on climate and health, they risk forfeiting this legitimacy and trust far sooner than any of us might anticipate. But delivering effective policies on climate and health isn't just a matter of sound investment or shrewd self-interest. It's a matter of human rights and justice. The economies and companies that have contributed most to global warming and unequal health outcomes have a responsibility to lead on finding solutions. In surveying the complex array of global challenges, the devastating con consequences of inaction and the often mediocre response by public leadership, it's easy to fall into a kind of despondency or even despair. In the words of the great Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, it can feel at times like, and I quote, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. But despair is not an option and has not been an option of this great uh, summit. We cannot afford it and our children and grandchildren will not forgive us if we don't step in and do what is right. I remain inspired and invigorated by words of two great men with whom I've had the honor to work with as members of the elders, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the late Kofi Annan. Um, I remember being on a panel with Archbishop Desmond Tutu in uh, New York some years ago in front of young people um, at a social good conference and they were all on their um, uh, iPhones and iPads tweeting as they were supposed to do. And Arch gets very excited when he's in front of young people and he was showing his love and expressing himself. And the journalist who was moderating us said quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dearie, I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope. And those words have stayed with me since because that means you see the glass may not be half full, but you see there's something in the glass and you work on it. And um, that has inspired me. And 
Kofi Annan always called himself a stubborn optimist. His lifelong commitment to justice and equality didn't permit any other way of looking at the world. Kofi knew that a better world was possible and worked to the very end. I was with him in Zimbabwe on his last mission. He wasn't feeling very well, but he pushed himself for the people of Zimbabwe because that was his priority at the time. And he became ill on the flight back to Switzerland and really didn't uh, recover. So as we go forward today, let's all take heart from their legacies and work. And together for a world where everyone enjoys the right to health, a thriving environment, and a peaceful planet to bequeath to subsequent generations. That's what it is to be human and to be in solidarity as a world. We have to recapture the solidarity that was there in 2015 with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. This is a bumpy time with nationalism and populism popping up around the place, but we have no time other than to regroup and do it with solidarity. Thank you very much for your patience and listening. Thank you.